Hey, kids, you like pro wrestling? Wow, well, we like pro wrestling too. I am Jeff Hawkins. He is Chris Novembrino. I am in the bubble. He is not. We I'm are in actually. The bathrobe. Uh, you're in a yes, you're you're you're, you're in very, the bubble. I'm in the bathrobe. You're, <laughs> you're very Lebowski esque. You need a white Russian in that outfit. Lebowski didn't go straight mustache. Like I, I I've truly. <laughs> what is I'm, with that? By what the way, is, what is with it? Um. Yes. Uh, okay. So, are you familiar with the handlebar mustache and culture? I I am. Yes, it's uh it's a whimsical and fun mustache. Uh, <laughs> it's not that whimsical and fun. No, it, 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 no, it is. It is. It is. Thank you very much. It's it's for uh, pretentious it, hipsters. That's no, what it, it's for. No, it's okay. I'm sorry. I grab a I'm, washboard no, and no, join no, no, Mumford no, 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 and this, Sons. This, this what is are you good. Do? <laughs> no, this is good. Facial hair can't help you, Hawkins. But no. in my case, in my case, facial hair does things for my face that frames it better. If if I got facial hair, I'd look like Dex from FTR. <laughs> yeah so i mean that's the thing it's like i can grow a good mustache that actually frames my face well no, so i'm doing no, it i'm hoping you know if you, you got some... it rock it is what yeah, i say and, and don't yuck someone's yum is also what i say and you're doing <laughs> both right now get some why are, you, why are you such a hater <laughs> because i'm good at it oh my god no <laughs> if, if it's not my mustache it's the professional wrestling industry which you revile oh um, I, look, no I no I, I mean it's uh, it's like why do we even watch wrestling you know i'm a, I'm a misanthropic jerk i guess i don't know <laughs> just... mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is this are we doing oh, our now therapy? it's therapy no, now no, it's yeah therapy. we're doing our therapy <laughs> <laughs> I, absolutely no tell me more about that where, where does that feeling come from no Jeff? no no as you know from our <laughs> pre-show talk us alphas don't need therapy so yeah, no, beta uh, types. It, no, right. No, therapy is us alphas. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> right, he, he tried to get that past me. He got a little bit further this time. Yeah. I just stopped it before it got into the building. No, we were we were talking therapy about therapy is just for people who are broken, you see. Well, no, we we were we were talking jobs and how downward trajectory of our salaries tends to go with not being as angry as we used to be. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was I was quipping, it, but it's partially true that as I've become more mellow as a person, I'm making less money. Yes. Yeah, uh, and, and it got to do with therapy jokes and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, hey, if it works hmm. for you, it works for you. Uh, no, I was going to tell you, get some 1920s clothes, you know, maybe a top hat. You know, you know play it's... a washboard in a band somewhere, you know, go full hipster. Come on. Okay, Jeff. But well, you know sorry. what? If you want to see me play in a band, this is, it's great that you mentioned okay, that. Okay, please you get your plug. You can see me at Albuquerque Tram Fest, the third longest tram in the world. We'll have the longest music festival ever. Because yeah. uh, we have Wings of Tartev and the the little crappy tram in Dubai. They're not doing a music festival. Like this, this is the longest music festival, the third longest tram, the longest tram in the hemisphere, a uh, Western hemisphere. Uh, and it's happening. It's going down at Sandia Peak Aerial Tramway. Tram Fest 23. Will you be using mustache wax on that thing? <sighs> Maybe. I'm still, <laughs> it, it, like, like, I don't think I need to. Honestly, I think it looks just fine in this. You know, for the little curls up. And this stuff. has so little to do with Tram Fest. <laughs> you get, like, honestly, it's at best. Oh, it's a, no, at you go best, to, this, it's, this aside is, is minimally adjacent to Tram Fest. The number one tram based music festival in the world what if they want nine days of peace (laughs) love and trams what if they want mustache rides at the tram fest chris well then they can scan the qr code and come to talk to me after the set (laughs) maybe we'll sneak into the new mexico museum oh that one was too easy um starting with uh, attention must be paid because we had a couple of passings in um tangential wrestling actually two people who participated in the battle royal at wrestlemania 2 if you've uh, ever seen that kids it's um what they did was they brought in nfl players to uh co-mingle with the wrestlers to see who was really tougher uh one of the participants in the actual battle royal itself russ francis former tight end for the san francisco 49ers during the joe montana days he, the son of Ed Francis, one of the uh, the, the main promoter in the Hawaii um, area for, for a number of years out there, passed away tragically in a plane crash um, in a small plane he was flying with, uh, with an instructor or something to that effect in Lake Placid, New York. And then earlier today, legendary 
linebacker from the Chicago Bears, Dick Butkus, passing away. Um, he was a referee for that same match. Uh, does the name Dick Butkus rhyme any, uh, ring any bells for you, Chris? Yes, it's a very memorable name. Well, no, I mean in terms of because he had a very long career as an actor as well in the 80s. And you pulled out a MacGyver reference last I, week. I did. I did. Now, I, I, know, I, like, I know who Dick Buckus is, but like I, I, I can't even put a name to it. I will give you a MacGyver reference if you'd like as okay. well. Are, I, you, I, are you a oh, MacGyver oh, fan? I, I, I might have watched a lot of MacGyver in college well. Uh, when MacGyver so does, the memories are a little fuzzy, but they're yes. there. Okay, when MacGyver decided to become a professional boxer, Dick Butkus was his coach. Mm. Um, he's I'm also. I'm going to rewatch that episode. That sounds like a good one. He was also on a number of uh, 80s sitcoms. He was on uh, Hang Time um, in the late 80s, early 90s on NBC Kids show. Uh, he played a, uh, a. He was on My Two Dads as the owner of the diner on there. I mean, if if you. <laughs> He was uh, from my childhood. He was uh, he was on a lot of Miller Lite commercials with uh, Bubba Smith and the less filling tastes great type things. I mean, quintessential. You need a football coach or something like that. You usually hire Dick Butkus. He was in any given Sunday. In necessary roughness, he was in the original Longest Yard. Um. Oh yeah. No. Okay. Now I'm seeing him. I'm seeing him. I'm yeah. Seeing now, him he was him. also an original coach in Vince McMahon's original XFL because Vince McMahon was doing the whole tough. We are hard nosed football stuff. And Dick Butkus, you know, legendary sixties football player decided to bring him in. He couldn't coach worth a darn. <laughs> Didn't last the entire season, but uh, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> when I was growing up as a kid, you know, everybody's father, you know, when you played defense, Hey, you're going to be like Dick Butkus, you know, every blue collar white kid looked up to Dick Butkus. And then every blue collar uh, African-American looked up to Mike Singletary. Cause he was the big middle linebacker for the bears then, you know? So it, it's always like, it's always middle linebacker for the bears, whatever it is. That's, that's always the blue collar hero would be it Butkus Singletary or uh, uh, Brian, Erlocker, yeah, in the 2000s. So, yeah, uh, rest in peace to him. Uh, getting into the actual wrestling, of course, big news Adam Copeland, aka Edge, making his debut at AEW Wrestle Dream. How do you feel about how they debuted him and possibly the follow up? We're kind of getting into Lazy River territory here, but that's because there's no sure, one. sure, sure. Um, so, uh, on the prediction episode, we basically more or less kind of uh predicted the outcome of this match uh i thought that this was a really nice pleasant surprise in the show uh i did think that the christian and darby allen match was going to over deliver this over delivered past my expectations of over delivery so I, I really enjoyed the match in terms of his debut and we can break down the match more in length later on but like yeah. i, I want to at least set that up because I, I thought that that it made sense to have the match as the main event i thought that let the match breathe a lot more and then we got to his debut at the end of the show made sense to do the debut at the end of the show like the big final reveal or whatever i didn't like him coming out and being a baby face uh, being adversarial with christian uh even though i mean on dynamite they sort of clean it up and you know they're like well, you know, you were attacking Sting. We love Sting. Why are you doing this? Blah, blah, blah. I would have had him be, I would have had him be a heel. I would have had his, you know, let the crowd cheer for him and then have him join in with Christian. Uh, that was my only knock on that whole sequence. Otherwise, that match was pretty much picture perfect, note for note. I just thought it was, um, it was unconfident to have him come out, unconfident writing to have him come out and be a baby face in that scenario. I think it's a, it's a thing... Tony likes to have the crowd happy when they're going home. Um, but I think longer term, like it makes a lot more sense to have Edge as a heel than it does to have him as a baby face. Interesting. I I, I think the baby face thing was the right call because you don't want the, oh, look, it's an invader from WWE and he's just going to trash AEW a <laughs> small time type of a thing. Um, what was brought up to me um, in listening <coughs> and reading some of the critiques about it on on sunday night early monday was i think they did something very subtle here in that christian was going to go for the concerto and then copeland makes his debut and i think 
the whole thing was, and this is, came in the cleanup as well, was that Christian Cage knew Adam Copeland was going to come out and was going to let him do the concerto the whole time. And then, and then Copeland had second thoughts because Sting got involved with trying to make a save. So I think they went with subtlety, but they didn't say it because it's one of those things where it's like, well, why, why are they not being defensive when Copeland comes out there? It's because Copeland was quote unquote in on it at the time and then had second thoughts. Um, I loved the visual of him shaking hands with sting. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, the promo on Wednesday at the beginning of dynamite, I didn't really care for, but we'll get into that in the lazy river possibly. Um, but yeah, that was the explanation for it was that, hey, he was originally, quote unquote, a heel. But as he came out and hey, that sting, then realization came in and he decided, no, I am going to be a baby face here. Mm. Do you buy that? Um, Doesn't look like it. I, no, uh, I think this is um, more of that writing your own story like, <laughs> yeah. thing that like AEW fans have been fairly common uh, or fond of doing here. Like they did it a lot during the Danielson feud with MJF. Uh, a lot of head cannon sort of stuff. Yeah. I don't I I think he debuted as a baby face because Tony wanted to send everyone home happy and he that's why the match was in the main event. Uh that he, this was the big reveal and he wanted everyone happy and saying that that was a good show and if like it, it, he just didn't want to have the crowd feel down leaving the building. Oh. They should have used our idea, and you would have never known it was Adam Copeland. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Edge's source is one of those million dollar ideas that they just leave on the cutting room floor for what I can only consider to be middling crap. Well, that's because we've mellowed out and we're getting a downward trajectory on our salaries. No, it's that. But like, I mean, if they had pounced on my Edge's source idea, if they had capitalized on that, who knows where this company would be now? As it were, like I, I wish them the best of luck going into next week in this war on Tuesday. Speaking but, uh, of which, if you had Edge of Source, <laughs> you'd be winning it, especially against JC Jane. Yes, next Tuesday, NXT loaded for bear with a bunch of main roster people, including John Cena, Cody Rhodes, Paul Heyman, and Asuka. And oh, look who comes over to Tuesday is a loaded for bear AEW Dynamite. Don't Title forget Dominic Tuesday. Mysterio is now champion again, too. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like. Uh, of course, uh, somebody in WWE confirming the Fightful, but that, yes, they have been using main roster talent on NXT in an effort to boost ratings to get a higher rights deal. Color me shocked. Slap me with a cold fish. What are sh people like money? Wow. <laughs> Sky is blue. People like but money. The, my point that I made this week was this discourse on Wednesday or whenever the numbers come out is no win for everybody. So just close your computers, walk away, read a book. Go to kiss, Tram Fest. Go to number Tram one, Fest. Number one tram based music festival in Albuquerque. Kiss and a girl, world. something because, Grass. because if NXT wins. It's going to be just because they cynically loaded up with a bunch of people from the main roster so that people would come over and watch. And if AEW wins, well... It's because people love the style of work that happens on AEW. <laughs> it's just because it's, the de it's no big deal because it's the developmental territory and it's NXT, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be just pure stupid. It's, and of course, I, we I enjoy, we enjoy the stupid. It's never, it's never the style of work on NXT if NXT wins, right? Right. Yeah. Because because they're the I'm, evil empire. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I like the style of work on NXT either. It's just, okay. Yeah. You a big fan of who was it? Uh, Ilya Petrovich or whatever <laughs> that that NXT. That, that's that's a real tournament looks care. terrible. No, it's, it's a real who's <laughs> care of the women's division. So who's that of the women's yeah, division? Yeah. yeah. Who cares? There you Says, go. Who cares? The real who cares? <laughs> well, you know they got a couple. Of, I mean, you know they got three women in there that are worth a darn. I think in there really. Um, that's that when you're stacking out a tournament of eight people, you definitely want three of the eight to be competent. <laughs> 
Well, well a good two, are, two, are, two are competent in one's personality. I like Santino's kid because she's just she's just an awesome flake. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that'll be next week. Oh, oh, I can't wait to be on Twitter afterwards. Oh, that's gonna be so much fun. But that's it for the news because it's a very slow news week. Um, ratings. Look, SmackDown two point three. They had their highest I think since uh, mm-hmm. July. They they're doing pretty well. Uh, the the big loser this week was Collision because they went head to head with No Mercy. Uh, th- it was uh, it was some uh, yeah, it wasn't good. I think it was like uh, three hundred thousand, a little bit over that, something to that effect. Um, and everything else is you know it's football season and Friday nights and other things and baseball's now coming up, so there's gonna be more rating stuff sucking the life out of wrestling, but. We had a lot of good wrestling over this weekend. We enter our lazy river of wrestling criticism, whatever we watch, whatever we're thinking about, whatever we'd like to bring up. We can do that right here. We have two premium live events slash pay-per-views to go over from this past weekend. And we have a preview of one for this weekend as the main roster breaks out WWE fast lane on Saturday night. So Chris, where would you like to start? No mercy or wrestle dream for your ice cold takes. Man, I was, I, I've only, I've seen selections from both, so let's do no mercy first. Uh, I watched uh, Ilya Dragunov and Carmelo Hayes, and I thought that was great. It, it was just it, it was it was so entertaining. Like, like, and as we said, Ilya Dragunov is just working at such a high level this year. Um, I think you know when we talk like wrestler of the year or whatever at the end of the year it's going to be very very hard for me to kind of pick anyone other than Ilya Dragunov I think he's just been having so many good matches all throughout the year and this is yet another one that you can add into his catalog and for WWE style it's so violent yes right like he's doing it in WWE which is the the, the, that's kind of the crazy thing for me is it's he is a highlight of work right now uh for me I I it's a very stiff style um he he, we've we've broken down his style length on previous episodes i feel like it'd be retreading a little bit but this this was yet another one of his offerings that just completely lived up to my expectations he's great he's really really good no and 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 Mello was Mello was great in this match too was also awesome no Mello is also great uh i don't know that i love identity crisis Mello's character yeah i find that i don't love it uh, but uh, especially in, in all the intrigue of Identity Crisis, Mellow is gone now that Trick Williams doesn't have a title. Yes. So, like, like the whole. They the built whole that up on you, Sunday as if it's going to be a next feud. The, and then... reason, the reason you do that is to have the buddy now have a title that's a lesser title, but you once had it and you're trying to, like, just so to dump it to Dominic is, 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 it's a silly foible in his character or whatever, but like, he's such a good wrestler. And uh, Ilya, for his part, I think. He, oh, I, I want, I hope that he like basically just is a perfectly gray character going ahead. Like he's just a dominant champion. I mean, he's kind of a heel when he needs to be a heel and he operates as a baby face when he's up against more like, you know, heelish opponents or whatever. Um, Just a big, strong, dominant champion. Uh, I watched the whole thing. So I'll give a few yeah, uh, please. quick thoughts here. Uh, You know, just going down the card. Blair Davenport being Kalani Jordan was kind of expected. Kalani Jordan getting a few moves in, but Blair Davenport, you know, just then destroys her. Corbin and Braun Breaker was a fun Haas match with just a stupid ending. That's what I, I don't re- even remember the ending. I'm looking at my Twitter. Corbin notes. wins, right? Yes. That was just, and that's to put him in line for Ilya. Next. right right but and i, well, I he, don't get he's that like, I, he, right he's a perfect well okay i get it in the sense that like Ilya needs to stack some wins and baron corbin's a perfect guy to do that against uh well, tr- trick and dominic as i said it's a to me it's it's a bad idea to then hot shot it back on tuesday back to dominic if you're going to do this uh was reported earlier by fightful that uh before he was fired that this was going to be mustafa ali being dominic mysterio for a "Quote unquote long title run." I don't know if that's true per se, but Trick Williams number one has improved drastically, and number two has improved drastically in terms of his presence and his mic work too. He is uh, he is becoming a total package in many many ways. Yeah, no, no. He when he came out and he had his interaction with Mello and Ilya and. All of that was going down at the beginning of NXT before things went pear-shaped towards the end of the show. 
I thought that he just like he absolutely fit in. Like they felt like three main event players now. Like he no longer feels yeah. like a sidekick. Like Trick Williams is a legitimate guy with his own character. The Trick and Mellow dynamic is actually really novel and interesting. And like like I I like a lot of the characterization that's been going on with them. They're two friends, legitimately friends. They're both climbing the ladder together. They both wish each other well, but there are going to be times where they're in each other's way necessarily. And I, I think that that's a really interesting dynamic. And Trick Williams has really risen to the occasion to make that work. Four-way tag match was a car crash, but a fun one. Uh, the Creed brothers are great. Garza and Carrillo are great. Out the mud, they're green, but they, they held their own. But for me, the family, uh, Tony D'Angelo and Stax Lorenzo, these guys are really good and they're getting better. And it's, uh, I mean, it was a fun match. It wasn't anything to write home about necessarily, but you know, you, you, you do all the spots you think they're going to do, you know, the cannonball from, uh, Julius Creed, the yeah, Brutus, Brutus or, is the cannonball. Oh, Brutus, you're right. Brutus, big guy, Brutus. That's why. Yeah. I gotta think of, of that. I, I always get those two mixed up, but yeah. And you know, D'Angelo did kind of the, uh, uh, you know, injured at first and then comes back to bravely, you know come back and help his partner type thing but yeah i mean they're doing good work down down in the junior circuit of, of wwe and and this tag team stuff was was fun too um also gonna give some major flowers on this next match noam dar and beat butch for the heritage cup and noam dar does something that's so difficult right now in professional wrestling and that he's a mid-card goofy comedy act that's an ass kicker during the match. And that is hard to do right now because you want to keep up the, Oh, he's just kind of a goof. He's kind of a geek, whatever, but he gets in that match and he beats the crap out of guys. And it's fantastic. And you know, it, it, it really, he could have some legs on the main roster doing this. And too small, too small. Vince will never do that. I know. Well, Vince, Vince only has input, as we saw from from Raw, as Johnny Gargano's back. Um, but uh, and and the only other match was the main event, of course, the Extreme Rules match between Becky Lynch and Tiffany Stratton. This was fun. I mean, Tiffany Stratton is a gamer, <clears throat> and I say this about uh, very very attractive women who don't need to be in wrestling who are willing to dirty themselves in terms of showing how tough they are and stuff. She took a chain to the face and bled hard way. And uh, we did not get pink weapons, but she also took the gimmicked uh, barbed wire bat to the thigh a bit. Didn't bleed, but still, I mean, she was, uh, I mean, she did, she did a swanton from the top rope to a table on the outside. Um, this match was great. Um, and, and, you know, Becky was there to lead her through the entire way. Uh, it went all over the arena. I kind of re regret not going, but somebody had to record on Saturday. No, I wasn't probably going to go anyways. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Stratton. Um, hey, did you know I have a mustache now? <laughs> I think Stratton's going to be fine. I, 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 she may get, she may get brought up sooner than later. I think, I don't think she's necessarily ready. But it's going to get a little bit crowded down there in NXT, especially now that we're doing a tournament of eight more women in there to, to supplement. This is a time of year in silly season where they just decide to bring up some NXT people to, you know, to to pad the roster a bit and see what they got down there. Well, no, but it also makes some sense too, in a world of Rhea Ripley, the incoming Jade Cargill, that Tiffany Stratton would be in Charlotte, of course, uh, larger women, uh, not like, you know, you know what I mean? Like tall. Taller. Like the, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Taller. Yeah. Like Amazonian. Um, and like Tiffany Stratton kind of fits. And Tiffany Stratton kind of fits into that universe a little bit better. Gotcha. Lost you for a second there. Um, and now on to Sunday's Wrestle Dream. And uh, 
my my description of this after I finished Wrestle Dream because I had somebody who's not in the wrestling bubble at all that I know from other life who who's trying to get back into wrestling, who wrote me and says, "Hey, do do you know anybody who knows Tony Khan?" And I said, "Yeah, I do, kind of. Why?" And I wasn't sure why they're asking. He goes, "Hey, can you tell them to put pay per views back on Saturday or not to run them so long on Sundays because some of us need to sleep." And I don't disagree. This this was the equivalent of a Brazilian steakhouse where they just keep feeding you meat and meat and meat. You asked you asked me if I watched it all, and I'm like, I no, because I've learned my lesson with the AEW formatting, which is that like it's basically a Brian Cage match that's they just get the shit in. Like, and like it's a lot of it. Uh and some of it's very good, but a lot of times it's a lot of it. Uh, so you kind of, and I've, I've found that I just have a sensory fatigue after about two, two and a half hours of wrestling. So it's I'm, like, I have to get my two hours in. I'm kind of with you a little bit um, because it's, it's very technically sound, good wrestling. Sure. But there's, for me, there's not a lot of, uh, of, of emotion in terms of levels until you get to the main event. Or the last two matches, or like that match, and then the, the the dead match. I'll, I'll go over this in a bit, yeah. but um, highlights for me, uh, Swerve and Adam Page, I thought it was a fantastic match. Uh, I agree with you on the Christian Cage Darby Allen match as well. That was uh, outstanding. Uh, that one of my favorite matches in AEW. I just I thought the flow of that match having. Darby out wrestle Christian. So like he gets the moral victory in the first beat. And this is not headcanon stuff, right? Like this is actually the story that they are clearly telling is that like Christian had to go to devious lengths after all this buildup of I'm the better wrestler than you, you know, like yeah, what you, all you can do is this stuff. And it's Christian who has to turn to all the hardware and all the like tables, ladders and chairs stuff. Darby Allen gets the victory on him initially by what's he roll him up or something like that. It's like it, yeah. uh, he got he got that first one by, by sticking his turtleneck over his head and giving him a roll up. Yeah, that was yeah, a, that was, was a fun cool. pin. That was a fun pin. And then and then the second the, the count out was so masterful. It was it was such good characterization. Christian, on one hand, does this devastating move that should get time to breathe and sell. And then he goes inside and takes the absolute easy way out of taking the count out. Uh, he doesn't even try to go for the pinfall. He just goes for the made opportunity after using all the hardware. It was such a good second fall as well. And, and there's just so much time for that moment to really breathe and like be savored. And that's an uncommon thing in AEW. Usually a big move is immediately followed up with another big move or another, we would just move the heck on. And in this case, folding on the back of the uh, stairs, and that is something that you have as your image for a good 90 seconds, upwards of two minutes. I thought that I, was great too. I wish they had hammered that point that you made that Christian decided to resort to the hardcore stuff. And and they, they mentioned it, but they, I, I mean, hammer it. Uh, no commentary. I think duffed it, but it's very clear that that's the story of the match. Because you've, you've actually made me rethink a point I had. Cause I didn't like Christian tearing apart the ring. I'm, I'm tired of that trope. I was tired of it when, uh, Chomp and Gargano were doing it in NXT. But it's it's great because it's the complete opposite of everything he was up to this. It no, was you've, all... you've talked me into it is what yeah. I'm telling you. Yeah. No, no, it's it's totally earned. And and yeah, I if they had been more I you know, Excalibur can do insulted and offended, but it always kind of comes off a little bit try hardy. I, I think this would have been someplace for Tony or Kevin Someone's Kelly. Someone's been pointing out that he's a hypocrite. Yes. That after, that after all of this, Christian's this big fat hypocrite that he, he said, they, Oh, I'm, I'm this great wrestler, but he's actually going back to his tables, letters and chairs stuff. And continue to hammer it because you have Nigel on the call. Who's doing, you know, who's playing heel commentator. Right. For the most, right. And he's doing a good job of it. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, no, I like no, it's, not, he, it's not his fault. He needs to be effectively challenged by the baby face commentator, the baby face opinion side, and also like the play-by-play guy. Yes. And that, that's what, what need to get over here. Now, um, a few matches have, have kind of flown under the radar a bit from, from the general talking points. Um, 
And then, well, that's actually not true. But anyways, let me get to the stuff I liked, stuff I didn't like. Uh, I liked the Don Callis family versus uh, Chris Jericho and the Golden Elite. Uh, that was a lot of fun with uh, Takeshita Osprey and Guevara getting the win over Jericho and the Golden Elite. You know, it was a fun six match. It was a, you know, it was a bit of a, you know, wild card going all over the place. And uh, it did what it was supposed to do, which is continue to build this Don Callis family, which got followed up on Dynamite, I think, in a pretty spectacular way. We'll get to some Dynamite thoughts after we... I, I wouldn't have had them lose, though. I wouldn't have had uh, Takeshka and Fletcher lose. Oh, they did. Oh, you mean on Dynamite? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it opened the door to for Callis to basically turn on Fletcher and then have uh, have Hobbs come out and and clean up. So I mean I get that, but we'll talk about it. Let let let's table that for a second. Sure. Um, I loved FTR and Aussie Open. Problem was this crowd was too tired to enjoy it. <laughs> I mean they were they were worn out and they're saving themselves for the main event. So this got the death spot, but. Uh, yeah, it looks like Mark Dave is going to be out for a while because he broke his wrist in that match, um, which is a shame. Which is why Kyle Fletcher was put into that uh, put into that Callis family match. Although they, I, I loved his his uh, hurricane cosplay, just just fantastic outfit that he was wearing. <laughs> Stop! They, they, those are the colors. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, those are the colors. Now here's where I, I, I mean, Brian Danielson and Zack Saber Jr. is being brought up as a match of the year candidate by. A lot of people, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna piss in your Cheerios about it. If you loved this match, great. I thought it was very good, and I, you know, and it, of course, it was, a, it was a technical wrestling masterpiece. I get that, and I, and I, I will, I will color my remarks here by saying I have watched a lot of Zack Saber Jr. up close in PWG, so that I might just be fatigued by it. I think my criticism of this match. And it's not really a criticism, it's a quibble. Is that it felt like two guys trying to put on a very good technical wrestling match. Instead of who is the best technical wrestler and trying to win the match. Um, You know, the ending came when uh, Danielson hit, had to resort to a couple of knees and they cleaned that up on Dynamite. I didn't exactly buy it. But for me, the match... The match felt like guys who were having fun and having they, they, their their goal was to have a good technical wrestling match, and and not tell the story of who the best technical wrestler was. If that makes sense, right? I I I'm with that. And then like the follow up on Zach Sabre wing, oh, you used a knee and you knocked me out. What a coward's move. On one hand, that's fun heel characterization that like getting like the tap out is better than just getting lights out. Uh, it, like it not really, I mean, that doesn't, there's no logic. So like on one hand, it, on another hand, I, I guess I'm like, why would Daniel to buy that as a valid argument? Like right. it, it's, it's one thing for the heel to disingenuously, like for, for example, to a Renee young, it's another thing for the baby face to whom the ridiculous argument is being made to actually internalize that and go, oh, yeah, well, I guess I do have something still to prove, and I'm going to prove it to you. Like, no, you actually don't. You there? I am there. I finished okay. my point. Yeah, you, yeah. Finish your, you finish your point, but you're, you were spiking a bit. I, I'm sorry. Uh the one match I didn't care for MJF versus the righteous defeating him by pinfall. Boy, it made the entire build for the righteous seem very stupid and pointless and frivolous. Like and they, then, they had, it felt like they had all this expositional reveal about Adam Cole and MJF. That was going to be a plot beat going ahead. And then MJF just wins. Well, the promo before the match where, you know, I'm going to take fat boy. I'm going to take uh white boy dreads and stick his head up his ass. It, this is, this is the comedy other side of the coin to a trope in WWE during the attitude era. And even beyond where triple H as champion would beat, you know, a tag team one on two to show how powerful he was. I, 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 I'm sorry. My old school brain 
still thinks tag team wrestlers and a tag team will always be better than two singles guys together. And two guys will always who work as a team will always be able to beat one guy. I understand people enjoy it, but what's I No, I, I, I hate, I hated that. Um, I'm, I'm with you as well. I think in terms of power differential, it may for a singles wrestler to be able to beat a real team or if he does it should require incredible outsmarting like let's say let's take it back to the 1980s and we have a match where the midnight express is going up against let's say dusty roads yes Dusty needs to somehow outsmart stan lane to get Bobby Eaton isolated to be able to overwhelm Bobby Eaton. Um, so, like, something has to happen where, like, Stan Lane gets distracted, runs to the back, and he's not actually there for the finish. Like, that's the that's the way you actually prevail. The singles guy prevails against the tag team is not by overcoming their double tandem moves. It's by isolating one of them yes. and taking advantage of that person in isolation. Same thing with a heel. Uh, it's actually even easier with a heel. You have a dominant heel and he's going up against the Hardy boys. Let's say like you take it back to 2000, you isolate, like you isolate Matt Hardy and you break his knee or something like that. And he's outside and he's soon, Oh, my knee, oh, my knee, my knee. And now Jeff's still in there trying to fight, let's say Kane. Right. And now at this point, Kane gets the tombstone pile driver, but like Kane shouldn't actually, I mean, I think they did do this back in the day, but like Kane shouldn't be able to beat the Hardy boys. Um, not when they're, you know, after the TLC like level or whatever, like he would need to isolate one of them to beat the other one. Yeah. I suspect we'll be talking a little bit about MJF as soon as we get through, we can blow through this fast lane preview because there's only five matches here. Let's um, do it. Let's do, let's go on the fast lane to fast lane. Uh, fast lane squared. <laughs> six man tag Latino world order of Rey Mysterio Santos Escobar and either Joaquin Wilde or Cruz del Toro versus Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits. The newly crowned, the newly minted heel team of the Street Profits, Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford. Uh, Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits are going to win. I think the real question here is does the LWO turn on Rey Mysterio? And I now think the answer is no. I, I think hope just- not. I think it's just going to stay in orbit in this, in this area. Yeah. Because that would also not make sense after the street province beat the crap out of Escobar Mysterio for Escobar, just turn around and go, I don't like you anymore, et cetera. But if they're bringing up dragon Lee, of course, you know, you never know, but I, 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 it feels squashy to me in terms of whichever one of wild or del Toro is going to be sacrificed while Ray and Santos get some offense in. Well, yeah, you, you think that one of the competitors is not named, and that's the one who's going to get pinned? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships, the, your champions, the Judgment Day of Finn Balor and Damian Priest taking on Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso. Ooh. This will be based on whatever happens on SmackDown, which we will not be able to watch before yeah. recording. So this, uh, this, this is a tough one. I, I think this this is a jump ball to me because I think there's interesting things you could do narratively in either direction. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Jay Uso wins the titles with Cody. I am going to go that this is going to be highly convoluted. And that they have decided to avoid, well, maybe not, because I'm I'm looking at that main event and I'm thinking to myself, but I could see something where they decide Finn and Priest lose the titles and then Finn cashes in Damian Priest's briefcase to then win the titles back as a tag team. Because you can do that with this money in the bank briefcase. You can do that. Oh, oh, I kind of like that. Uh, that that's actually fun though. Uh, and then that increases the tension again between Balor and Priest because Balor. Cause they, no, they win the title and they win the titles back, but like Priest is pissed off because yes. he's not going to get to go for a real singles title now. Yes, <laughs> I like that. Okay, I I, I I'm I'm. I know that that's kind of like camp. I, I that's actually a fun deployment of the briefcase. It's new because I don't think he's gonna. I don't think he's ever gonna cash in against Roman. 
And I think Rollins is the target here, but I'm just not sure what they're thinking with him now. So uh, for the WWE Women's Championship, a triple threat between EO Sky, Asuka, and Charlotte Flair. It will be set up by a tag team match tomorrow night. Charlotte Flair and Asuka taking on EO and Bailey. I I have my thoughts here. Um, EO has been doing nothing as champ. They never broke up damage control. And I think what's going to happen here is they're going to break up damage control and EO's still going to lose the title. Yeah. This feels like Charlotte Flair is getting a title run. I know yeah. it's crazy. I, I don't think it's crazy at all. Like I have a hard time betting in Charlotte Flair in pretty much any scenario they put her in because yes. like they, 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 She's not at Cena levels of like overwhelming, but like Charlotte Flair, when they want to push her, she becomes Cena levels of overwhelming for like flashes of time. And it just, it feels like we're coming back into Charlotte season. Yeah. And, like, and remember, you know, I don't like it, but like, doesn't she make sense for Jade Cargill? We're in that season where we're starting to set up things. We're, we're going we're gonna to get the titles off the people who, who you know, we, we put on SummerSlam or maybe even Survivor Series. Or we're going to use Survivor Series for this. And we're going to start building whoever the champs are for Royal Rumble season where we start setting up your Mania matches. And this feels like, all right, Eos had her run. Yep. She's not been much of a champion because of this damage control thing, even though damage control is a lot of fun. Let's give the belt to Charlotte so that she can, you know, she can, you know, so yeah. And I, I think it might be correct. Although I, I, I on it, raw, like, so it makes a lot of sense for her. I mean, what, Oh, she's on raw right now. Uh, yeah. I mean, when they want to move her, they'll move her. Um, it, it just, it makes, it makes too much sense to read Io Shirai as a transitional champion in WWE yeah. versus, a person that they truly trust to run stories through going into WrestleMania season. John Cena and LA Knight taking on the bloodline of Jimmy Uso and Solo Sokoa with Paul Heyman. This one seems obvious to me. John Cena gets a lot of the offense, gets a lot of the cheers. LA Knight gets the pin on one of those two. Yeah. And so then it also makes me think even more that Jay wins. Uh, Jay and Cody win the titles. So that Jimmy loses, Jay wins. That, oh, okay. Yeah, you got that dichotomy thing going there. Because Jimmy's got it. Jimmy and Solo are definitely losing here. There's like, I oh. mean, right? Are they? Okay. Let's yeah. Stop, yeah. Let's yeah. stop. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, like, because you can't pin LA Knight right now, right? Like, you can't have Solo Sokoa spike. No, because I think we're getting no. LA Knight no. and Roman for Survivor right. Yeah. Series. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Like, like uh, and they're not going to have Solo. I mean, having Solo pin John Cena would be a big deal. Uh, but I don't think they're. No, they're losing. I, I, I yeah, I'm with you. Okay. And then in your final match, <laughs> maybe. I don't know if this is going to be the main event. This is just the one listed as number one, but it's for the World Heavyweight Championship or the World uh, Consolation Championship. Yeah, yeah, the Consolation Press. Last man standing match between Seth Friggin Rollins and Shinsuke Nakamura with the most ridiculous segment I think I've ever seen in professional wrestling of a pre-tape that knows the count at the same time. <laughs> I could see Rollins pulling this out and Priest cashing in with the bad backstory. I get it. I like my story better. <laughs> oh, I no, I think it's way more interesting. I mean, I, I you could still you could still have Jay and Cody win. Finn cashes in the Money in the Bank briefcase and the rematch too. Yeah, I, uh, but I, but it does feel like like this last man standing match seems like a perfect uh, candidate for Damian Priest to get in there, and this screams pick up briefcase piece. cash in. Yeah, in the it does. It does. Because look, Rollins and Nakamura, while I love both guys, is a B feud. Uh, not Nakamura's been ice cold until this feud. I'm glad that he's got his music back. It's going to be a nice match. I mean, it, it, look, if it's going to be a walking brawl with Nakamura, sure, I'm here for this, man. I'm, I'm gonna... I think they'll they, they'll have good, like, characterization. Like, a walking brawl with Nakamura and Rollins actually, like, provides a lot of opportunity for good character work from Nakamura. Because, like, 
Nakamura ain't doing uh uh he he, he ain't he ain't the guy uh he ain't the guy in my t-shirt from 2013. No. Uh no no like but he's still like fun as a character at this point. Uh and like yeah, I guess there's some room for that. Man, I really see this as the Damian Priest cash in. So maybe they lose the titles and then that and then Priest gets gets uh then he gets a singles title and then it turns into where's your title Finn because that's that seems to be the big thing I think that's going to be the Judgment Day storyline is one of them at any given time isn't going to have a title going ahead. That they're going to have a lot of the belts, but someone's always going to be missing a belt going forward here. Okay, Raw, NXT, Dynamite, the Lazy River is now open, Chris. Where do you want to go? Boy, I mean, we have we have hit a lot of these points, um, but... Uh... All right, let's talk MJF, man. Like, what? What do we? How do we feel about where MJF is as a character right now? He stinks. I I agree. I I I I, I, I don't I care about this. Doing. Go ahead. But is he bad? Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, I just the oh. devil thing is really annoying. I I like him, especially because when Jay White jumped him, then it was like. Whatever whatever happened during the jumping was apparently fairly insubstantial last week, which makes like what even if MJF was in a devil's mask, all he did was beat someone up backstage who's a dick and like who was clearly going to jump him. He got the jump on a bad guy. I mean, I think in order for the is MJF really evil when he puts on the devil mask sort of thing to, to work, Jay White needed to come out and be like a credible challenger for MJF's belt. And MJF injures him. That story's over. The way he avoids that title match, it, like, or, or like that, if you think he's the devil, the way he avoided the title match is that he took out Jay White's knee and he's out for six to eight weeks now. End of feud. I, I think it m- misunderstands how to deploy the devil mask aspect of MJF to just have Jay White be able to come back the next week and ambush him and ambush him. Uh, like a, a, a devil, or even if there's going to be intrigue, is, is he really the man in the mask? That's only intriguing to me. If it, it seems like, in a way that's almost uncomfortable, the baby face has the clear upper hand on these four guys. I am taking a different tact into why I don't like this character. Um, it, and I brought it up last week. It's very, but and I like MJF too. I had hopes for him. I was saying, put the belt on him. So let me let me get those let me get those biases out there before anybody buries me for this because I I'm it's one of those I thought you liked MJF I do like MJF oh, I think he's, he's really working with the audience I mean like the he's our scumbag like they they love him yeah, he's it's great, great. It, it's 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 the weekly catchphrase a la Jericho it's the we've gone now into the tofu chant and the dueling ass boys uh what something taint and and he 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 defenestrated the entire main heel group on collision that is my problem here is that those guys are now all goofs including jay white and i i I think for me it's the execution Um, it is yeah no no if devil mjf shows us like like the, the the question mark of devil mjf shows us that he can absolutely decimate the main heel faction on another group or like by by playing by heel rules or whatever that's intriguing when he just comes out and cracks jokes and calls jay white tofu that is not intriguing well, what he's saying is he's saying your gimmicks suck well yeah it, it's not it's fine. not that no, you're bad wrestlers or you're not yeah. tough guys. Yeah, it's it's that, and that's where no, I'm. I'm it, it, no, but I mean, I'm with you. It's the literally last week he was like, "You were a marketer's dream." Like, like I mean, like that. That's like it's so weird. It's like a character saying to another character, "You know what? You're just some like weird writer's nerdy fantasy." Like that's that's a very strange move for a character in a TV show to make. Although I will give props now because we have six weeks to build this feud because they announced that this was going to be the match. At full gear. Um, you know, I liked White coming out and just knocking him out. That was great. But other than that, it was just like so, Yeah, it's so interesting, like what bothers you and what bothers me. It's totally I, I actually hate it. Like 
it it completely undermines the entire murder mystery aspect to Devil Mask. Uh, and when Jay White comes out and annihilates MJF. Oh, I don't think I don't think MJF is under that mask. I know, but it's supposed to be a murder mystery. Yes. Dude. Okay. Okay. Like he's <laughs> sure he's the red herring. I. I... Okay. No. No. I, now. Now. Now I'm feeling you on the on the narrative. Okay. I got you. Yeah. Like yeah, you you kill him as a suspect. Are we, are we getting Brit as a femme fatale? That'd be kind of cool. It'd be better than Tony Storm doing Laurel Van Ness. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie. I, I, for what movie? What movie was she actually uh, doing there? Um, Sunset that, Boulevard. So, yeah, Sunset Boulevard. I was like, I, which I, I like. I, I mean, I, I like, kind of like that. I kind of like that. I like to, I like the Tony Storm character, and I like the I, character. I also like that you're still young, like because she's like what thirty two. Um the, the 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 issues I had were R J City being in the vignettes because he's wacky. Twenty seven. <laughs> and, and 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 now the and now the crane zoom for her thing you know kind of like the opposite of the uh give the people what they want when she does the yeah. frame thing and it comes into her i'm just like, oh no we're gonna go full. they are going full-on wacky character on aew because uh oh before we leave mjf that uh that max caster vignette which was only for people who follow their interactions on Twitter, that's what that was. And, oh. and nobody got that unless you have been heavy, heavy into watching how they interact with each other on Twitter. I also thought it was really funny that they re-aired the Roddy Strong and uh, Adam, like Adam Cole. Well, I, I, <laughs> I have an entire rant about this because. That, that, may, that made me howl. I like, I mean, okay, you duffed the sound. You should just apologize for the sound sucking and moving on and move yes. on rather well, than the well, it. Hold on. Chris, when you watched this either the first or the second time, it did, didn't get better. Did any of the dialogue seem especially witty to you? <laughs> was uh, there any uh, were there any uh, character I, lines? I, I, I thought actually the, the audio F up was doing it some favors. <laughs> like, like I didn't this this sucks. I, I hate, I, but the move it, itself sucks because it's like Tony announces on Twitter. Oh, we're going to do an overrun because, because we don't want you, the fans to miss the sketch comedy genius here. That was Adam Cole and Roderick strong and the kingdom and Matt Taven stroking a giraffe and them racing around on a scoot. This was all visual stuff. Anyways, who gives a crap about the dialogue? Because everything in there was based on shots in there, and they set it up that way, including the when Adam Cole is moving furniture and he looks in the mirror and he sees the kingdom laughing at him. It, it's it's <laughs> oh hold on hold on my comedic genius was not fully appreciated. I need oh, that to oh, run again, to Turner Networks. You just play people. Let me tell you about my best yes, friend. I was saying the same thing. Yes, yeah, Courtney about his that. father. Yes. Yeah, you just play that over the scene. Uh, yes. Oh, you get to the part where, like, I mean, literally, Roddy comes in, Adam, whatever his crappy character is doing now, and then like at the end of the people, let me tell you about the best friend montage, seventy style. We get another Adam, and like he's like my neck, and like that's the end of it. Like, like there, I, I just saved you thirty seconds. You, you literally read my mind on the courtship of Eddie's father, and I failed to bring it up on my show last night because I was like, oh, that's too old of a reference. <laughs> <laughs> Me, the old guy. <laughs> but yes, I mean that's all it is. Is it's a vin it's a, it's a montage of friendship. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like a seventies, eighties style musical montage. Just plug a song in. That probably you get that song. There was no clever dialogue, and well, who cares about the sound? We got the point. Let's let's move on. You know that kind of thing. But um, uh, I, I've given something. You go ahead. Uh boy. Uh I mean we we also got in Timeless Tony Storm in there too. Uh so let me see what else is on here. Um If you want time to think, I got two things. No, no. I, I mean I'm just I'm like just like looking through the dynamite card again. I, I don't know. Like they keep murdering Tony or the Sky Blue. It's kind of like <laughs> what is the point of her? Uh let me ask you something because I I brought this sure. up last night and I wasn't sure about this either. Uh Tony Storm, or not Tony Storm, but Sky Blue had a bit of a 
it, it was subtle, but it felt like a little bit of a presentation difference after the Black Mist, where it seemed like she was a little bit more dour and she wasn't made up as well and she wasn't smiling and happy. And I wasn't sure if it was a bad night or character choice. Mm, mm. I don't know. Okay. Maybe, no, I, I, I mean, like she's on a losing streak. Maybe she becomes an acolyte of Julia Hart. Okay. I, I clown on and I clown on AEW a lot. So let me give you two things I loved. Okay. I loved the Samoa Joe promo. Oh, that was a lot of fun. This was pro wrestling for me. Big burly badass showing you how much money he makes. Holding the cigar and the and the adult beverage and just telling you when I want the title, I'm coming for it. I'm like, yes. That's just classic stuff. And that's was, all I want. A decent attempt at cleaning up a very silly finish to that yes. match. Yes. Um, I, I I actually think his tone like I liked a lot of it. I think his tone when he turns to sort of start addressing MJF needed to change. Okay. I thought, I think that the first two thirds of that totally awesome. Like I, I've beaten a bunch of people. I, I kill people when I want to, I eat when I want to, I, you know, I have a drink, I have a smoke, I'm a champion. Um, I loved all of that. Um, I think I, I, it's hard for, it's hard to explain why he shook MJF's hand, but yes, I, that is that, that, that I started that, 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 that was a, a, a very strange beat in that match. Like if anything, when MJF sticks out his hand, Joe should have slapped that shit away. And like that, if he had done that, I, I mean, I actually would have preferred him to say, I shook your hand. Um, because of something involving Ring of Honor, basically, like bring up like uh, there was like a night of ROH or whatever. That's yeah, not that you earned my respect, but didn't earn my respect. Yeah, no, yeah, it was it was like out of respect for Ring of Honor and the tradition that I built at that place. So to not shake your hand would have been disrespecting myself. But that's the only reason I shook your like. uh, Yeah, I know what you are because I think again, I think the intrigue with MJF as champion here is like. Is he a baby face? Is he really your scumbag or is he just a scumbag? Yeah. And like that should be the open question with this. And you should have people like Joe and the righteous sort of openly casting doubt on this. The righteous thing. did on that promo that they did, right. the video thing. Right. Where it's like, like you're a liar. Yeah. You've got good puzzle pieces to play with here to make MJF a very interesting character. Yes. And, and like, I mean, part of the reason I'm critical of is I can really see a way with some small tweaks where you can make him a very compelling, unique, uh, baby face question mark sort of champion. And like, it, like have it always be this, uh, thing that this open question that heels are saying, and then maybe they're right someday, or maybe they're not, but like, you just keep it open enough at yeah. all times. You know what they need is just MJ have to come out. No, no promo burying the opponent. Come out and win a clean babyface match, and just and and no, no shenanigans, nothing, and everybody just kind of be like, "What was that?" Kind of a thing, just to keep people off 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 guard a little bit. You should be a sus babyface. Yes. Yeah, like, like like that 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 actually. I mean that that sort of would be a very interesting twisty sort of thing. Instead, you've got. You have sort of the, the the seeds of that out there, right? But like again, not being executed. And the Joe promo missed the mark on that for me. Uh, and then you still have all this goofus stuff with Adam Cole and uh, Neck Boy, uh, Roddy Strong, and the nerds. And like, I hate it. Yeah, I I really that one. I was just like, okay. The the, the thing that made the MJF Adam Cole vignettes funny was that MJF was such an absurd character to the point where even Adam Cole would have to cut him off and go, wait, what are you doing type of a thing? With Roderick Strong, he's an absurd character, but he's not absurd enough to to throw Adam Cole back into being the straight man. And that's the problem I ha- have with the two dynamics right there. Yeah, he Adam Cole comes off as the putz, not the straight man. Yeah. Um, yeah. I loved the Christian Adam Copeland segment to end the night. I thought it actually saved what I thought wasn't a very terribly strong dynamite. 
I agree. I, I, don't, I, I didn't think there was a strong dime. I don't know saved it, but it definitely. Agreed. Well, it's always that, you know, that last memory you go, huh? Ah, no, no, no. Of a show. <laughs> um, I agree. I agree. Um, on, on, Cop- part oh, yeah, no, no. Uh, on Copeland's part, he seemed very relaxed. He, the self-deprecation shock because I just referred to myself in the third person. Who does that? Not sure if that was scripted or not, but it was a fun moment. Um, the only moment that felt unearned for me from him was him telling Christian Cage that Nick Wayne and Luchasaurus would turn on him the moment that they had taken all the knowledge from him. Nick Wayne just turned, guys. There, there's no, there's no. <laughs> they're all, and Luchasaurus has proved Luchasaurus himself an idiot. Has proved himself loyal to Christian, despite the fact that Christian has abused him. And for stupid. months and months and months. Stupid. Yeah, no, like, like Lucha, I mean, you could say he's uh, yeah, loyal, abused, not smart enough to break the abuse yes. cycle. Like, like, like clearly incapable of seeing through it when other people have even tried to tell him. So it's like, <laughs> I, 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 and one other thing, it does not appear that Luchasaurus is getting smarter, which is the whole predicate of he's, Adam Cole. He's not argument. evolving at yeah, all. Yeah, no, he's like, like, an he got somewhere. a lizard brain, man. This guy's a nerd. <laughs> Yeah, no, when, when, when that line came out, I go, that is just the most ridiculous. No, so that almost not, took me that, off. That, that almost took bad, me out of it. Uh, I was, that's a bad, it was a bad argument. That's yeah. not what's been happening with this yeah. dynamic. It, it, Christian is in full control of this stable. What are you talking about? You, like, <laughs> do you even I mean, watch if, the product? The, the better way, you know, the better way of thinking about, like, I mean, what's the Christian dynamic, right? Luchasaurus is his pet, his attack dog, and Nick Wayne is his fake son. Yes. Uh, yeah, and like that's what's going on here. Like they're not both like <laughs> predate on him and boy, <laughs> we're gonna trick yeah. the old man eventually and take his title. Isn't Make it? the evil Jurassic Express. No, that's like not where this is going. Uh, <sighs> well, was the, uh, there, there was something in my head that I that I was gonna say and I can't think of it now, but it was funny. Um, <laughs> I, I would have much preferred uh, again Edge and Christian together as like Nick Wayne's evil two dads. But, it's my two dads, only they're evil. But the uh, yeah, it it's it, it was one of those things. It's like they're gonna they're gonna turn on you eventually, type of a thing. It's like that is such a forced thing and stuff. But you know, other than that, I mean, he was relaxed. He wasn't in that WWE style type of thing. I mean, look, it was very people were crit criticizing it because oh it's so bloodline type story it's lore it's this it's like well that's what angles are guys i hate to no, tell no, but you this all is, that this is bad foreshadowing and like let me make the ex- explanation why okay now christian either has to win every title match he's in against every other baby face prior to nick wayne um therefore removing any of the intrigue in any of his upcoming matches or that foreshadowing has to mean nothing, and Adam Copeland's just entirely wrong. Like his first promo was a giant swing and miss. See, Those... the only way I can see this work now is if is if Jack Perry comes back and takes over for Nick Wayne and 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 Luchasaurus. Um, Jack Perry really should join up with Christian too because he doesn't have a dad either. Well, yes, we've made that clear on the promo. Yeah, no, no, yeah, you know, his, his dad was Luke Perry. He was was he? On, yeah, on nine hundred two one zero. Uh That said, Christian Cage was fantastic in this segment because he was telling stories with his eyes during that entire Adam Copeland promo, where where he he's pretending to buy in to the uh, nostalgia, and you can see it on his face, and it's like, and he's not saying anything, but it's so good. And then he just gets straight, you know, uh, dead deadpan before giving the hug to to Cole. And then his face changes in the hug too. The face changes in the hug and then the line go f yourself was so strong in terms of a in terms of not just a no I mean there there's two ways you can do this. No or f no. <laughs> and f no Feels really, especially after all the work that he put in there with 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 the emotion work on his face, doing some clever film work for for a wrestler. I know people harp on me when I get into the acting stuff, but just watching it. We're always really they're like they're uh, in terms of wrestlers, they're pretty darn good actors. Yes, I mean they're great comedians, but they're also great, you know, heels. Both of them. I mean, Edge's rated art thing was great. Um. 
I, I forgot to ask you this when we started. Is this a new era for AEW? Is this something that will move the needle? Because I am under the opinion it's more like, like I'm happy for, for Copeland. And I don't think the pressure of him putting a company on another level should be on him, even though he will take it. But this feels like, this feels like the big box office draw who wants to do some indie films as 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 he's kind of aged out of being an action star type of thing more than I'm here to beat WWE type of thing. This is him playing with FTR and Uncle Jay and a few new guys and he's going to be able to have some good matches here and he wants to go he wants to go to Japan and face Okada. 50-year-old Adam Copeland, I'm not sure about 30-year-old Adam Copeland, I would have loved that. Um but yeah, is this a new era? Because we're concentrating on character work. We're concentrating on one Mr. Copeland. What do you think the numbers are going to bear out in the future here? I, I don't think he's a needle mover. I, okay. I, mean, I hate I hate to burst people's bubbles. Um, In terms of potentially entertaining television, uh, Edge yeah. and Christian in many different configurations could very much be a strong narrative anchor that this show needs. Um, in a way that, in my opinion, I, I, I get that people like the, the Don Callis family matches, but I don't find any of the skits or the segments to be doing anything for me. Um, Matt and Nick Jackson don't do character work like that. Uh, and this show does need someone to be sort of like the character anchor for this show. Uh, Edge and Christian potentially offer that energy they're strong promos they they're they're engaging um and the mjf also doing that uh but all, like in a much more you know shaky way as we've discussed in the past but i don't think it's like a new era or anything like that i just think that this is an elevation of christian's status on the roster and edge being alongside christian will ensure that christian's more of a centerpiece on the show and for my taste uh, I, I welcome that because I enjoy Christian matches. Um, I just, I, I hate, again, I, I hate that Edge introduced either a false prophecy or an incredible plot armor onto Christian matches going forward here. Like, that was a bad mistake. Um, NXT, the only point I had was was trick. So I can throw I can throw a couple more AEW points at you if you don't have anything. I uh, I mean, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, no, I don't have any other points. Okay, that. yeah, Wardlow, what was that? Uh, we're he really hasn't doing, been on TV. We're really doing this again with him? No, I, 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 I didn't. I mean, I watched that, but like, geez, we're doing this again. I got mad at that because, like, you have 12 people backstage to do interviews and nobody tried to get a word in as where he's been, what he's doing. It's just what, and, and then, and then a commentary was just kind of like, yay, squashed a guy to the back. And you're just like, we haven't seen Wardo in five months. Where's he been? What's his motives? Why hasn't he been here? Give me something. Because for me, the move would be to bring Wardlow in as the secret partner of one Kanosuke to tap. To Kesha, yeah, yeah and right. Put him in the put him in the Callus family there. Not that I don't like Hobbs here, because I thought the Hobbs rebirth was great, especially after all the QTV nonsense. But <laughs> you know, it it was one of those things where it's like we've been looking for creative for Wardlow for months now, and he he comes in five star beating of Griff Garrison for Griff. His partner's now over on NXT getting star vignettes, and he was the talent of that varsity blondes team. Who, Out of the three of them, Julia Hart, Pillman Jr., and Griff Garrison. Griff Garrison's the one who loses here? Yeah, yeah he was what? one of them. What? All right. But yeah, I, I, I want something with Wardlow. I want more meat with, with Wardlow. Give him something to do here. I you, just... this You can't Goldberg him a third time? Like, yeah. I... I so yeah, he the, needs he needs a motive. He needs a manager. He needs something. I get that this might be. He's a, a refried Goldberger, is what he is. Reheated and, Goldberger. And then the Al Cervix special to open the uh, open the card here. The uh, the was it? <laughs> I always get the Jacksons mixed up. But uh, Nick, yeah, Nick Jackson versus I think it was uh, Ray Fennec. Phoenix. Yeah, yeah, Phoenix. Yeah. Where, ow, my arm, ow, my back comes up about you know. 
every five minutes or so, and then they're just going full speed. Um, I liked the spot. I like the spot where where Nick kicked the post, and then Phoenix sweeps the leg, and he ends up in a handstand for a second there before you know as he bumps his head. But overall, this got re- this is cotton candy match, and this is why I can't get into a lot of indie style AEW because we're doing super cutters and Canadian destroyers, and the guy supposedly has a bad back that he's selling every twenty seconds. Not it, really. This and is, he's kicking this is out the at type two. Of match I don't like. This is yes. the type of match that they do on this show that I do not like. Why is Ray Phoenix the indestructible man? That's what you know, and that, that gets Why me. are all of the biggest moves being done in the opener match? That too? I, I, I'm like I, I know I Mr. Like Cornette, a, please you have the floor. <laughs> no, I, I know it's like an old man, but it like like it really it's like okay, you you like basically are firing all the guns on the on the big match. Like like there's very little that someone can do later on in the show that hasn't already been done in the beginning of the show. Yeah, uh, it's like ECW in the late nineties if they had started with, Hey, you're gonna go through ten tables here, and then we're gonna have a match with I don't know some <laughs> Paul. <laughs> you know what the genius of a Rob Van Dam JT match was? Smith and and super crazy after that. I, I have really that. come around. Okay, Rob Van Dam. I I really revised up my assessment of Rob Van Dam in terms of like the quintessential like upper mid card act in those ECW cards. Here's what's great about him, right? Always got the crowd pumped when he did his match, but like in a way that at least for a good long time didn't overshadow the main event unless the main event was really weakly produced. And here's why. Because Rob Van Dam basically does the same spots in every single Rob Van Dam match. <laughs> so it's not like, like, and like, you know, okay, I'm not going to do the Van Terminator or anything like that because that's what RVD does. And so like, while he does do several big moves during that match, and they're always spectacular, especially by the standards of that day, um, he also, you know, would leave room for like Taz or Shane Douglas or whoever the champion was at the time, um, to have a very different style of match and they could do all sorts of other moves because you predictably and reliably knew what a Rob Van Dam match was going to be. And it didn't necessarily try to do every single move that's in the wrestling handbook. Whereas like the Matt Jackson, Nick Jackson, Ray Phoenix is also definitely guilty of this too, along with yeah. and any number of these other guys, they do these crazy super finisher moves, get a two count. And like, you know, very much uh, AEW fans like to point out that WWE very much likes to crutch on near falls as a trope. And like, that's what these style of matches do too. And that's why they stink in my opinion. Yeah. Like, I, I don't like these near fall centric matches particularly when the near falls are like, you know, getting shot with a shotgun for a two count. I hate that. And I hate it. I mean, just to go back to it, I hated the ending of that trick Williams, Dominic Mysterio match. Oh, that was ridiculous too. I, right? I, you know, Mel you need, needs to show up at some point during that. I mean, we have, you know, 12 different distractions to eventually get the guy and nobody ever figures it out as a baby face that, Hey, I need someone out there to stop this. Or you need competent referee. And they also, the problem is they do this every week. Every single week. And it's not the same as, say, you know, the horsemen just run in to beat a guy down and take the loss because and beat the guy down. It's, it's a Rube Goldberg device of interference every single week. And in multiple matches, not just Judgment Day aren't the only ones to do this, but... No, but it's but, like no, one of those things where you need less is more on this, and it makes it special when you do it in highly emotional moments, as opposed to, you know, as a as a transition plot device on your <laughs> on a weekly television show. That that's 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 the difference to me. No, M- Mello needed to come out and try to make the save at some point. Yeah, but like initially, you know, like okay, the crisis of conscience thing dumb too anyways especially like you abandon ship on that like this is actually the perfect opportunity especially if you're well, going to take the title off a trick here's a good opportunity for Melo to come down and make the save i i will defend this because they actually they have they, there's a logical po- point to this where he couldn't come out because he had left the arena he was in the parking lot remember going to his car and saying hey i got a call from john cena he'll be there to be my second next week 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I hate to throw cold water on your rant here, but uh, no, you know, hey, that, 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 hey, that trick has more than one friend here. How about that? You know, maybe someone can see injustice and want well, to. Well, how it about upon better himself. way of putting this? Maybe the Judgment Day has more than one enemy. Yes, that too. Yeah, like, like yeah. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah, no trick. Like arguably, trick doesn't because he's been so all in on Melo. Um, so like, like that. I think that's maybe that I'll pour cold water on that Hawkins, but the, the judgment day, <laughs> judgment day have, I can do it with animus, Chris. So I was you, just saying, you know what? I'm trying to be more successful. And in order to be successful, you need to be angry. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 that's the one thing I've learned in this life that what did I do. <laughs> no, you take, your, you take your, your frustration, your shame, your guilt, you turn it into anger and you let that fuel you to success. Yeah. Uh, I am, I am, Definitely looking forward to Oscar Roxanne Perez. That segment sucked. That four, that's that, that thing setting up the, the three way with oh my Becky, god, that was the worst thing this week. I, I hate to for all the people going, Oh, you're too hard on 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 dynamite. Oh let me god, let no, me go. No, over no, 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 that, that, that was not how garbage. Much, how much that was hot segment, garbage. This was three baby faces who can't talk. Who are tra- who are all supposed to give a little bit of tood and make them less likable? There is no reason for Roxanne Perez, lovely as she is, sweetest, happiest, straight ahead baby face, has a lisp, which is a bit of a problem, and then coming out with the the leather jacket and trying to talk tough here. I uh, no 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 no, just have her be straight ahead. Same with Lyra Lyra, uh, Lyra Valkyria. And and same with Indy Hartwell. All these people are people we've been building up for the NXT universe to actually like and get behind and be great stories straight ahead. Hey, these are people. This is friendship. This is great. And all of them come out here and are jerks. And you're just like and Becky's and Becky's uh uh proclivities don't help either when she's doing the uh the Conor McGregor thing. But I'm just like. I'm watching this. I'm going, I hate all three of you. I want Tiffany Stratton to kill all of you. If that's, that's a, or, or Kiana James, who's always a welcome sight for me, but it, it, you know, just cause she is, she's a gamer. I like her. Um, it was kind of weird for her to interfere in a match and then say, Oh yeah. And then Perez is going to be facing Oscar. Did she hire Oscar? How does that happen? <laughs> Why is Oscar why aligning herself with Kiana James of all people? I, I don't get that, but, but back to it. Yes. Don't make Roxanne Perez unlikable in any way, please. Thank, please, and thank you. I, I was baffled by the pairing of Thea Hale and JC Jane against Lola Vice and Electra Lopez. Like this is just not the tag team you do this with right now. Uh, and to to wit, they at least realize that like you can't beat Lola Vice right now. That would be the, the dumbest thing. Um, so they have Electra Lopez tap out, which is also stupid in its own right. Uh, they've kind of cooled off on her a little bit. I, I was like, I mean, the segment itself was entertaining. I was just like, re- really? You wouldn't just have them do this against two enhancement, like squishy baby. Yeah. Things. And the, pro- and the other problem there is sky blues and throw them in there. Yeah. The best part of this feud was on Twitter again, because they showed the tweets on screen and JC Jane's comeback of, Hey, Settle down, Jenny from the corner. <laughs> and Electra Lopez was a fantastic line. Um, and I love this duo, and I love that they're it's weird because it, it's working because JC's kind of giving in to chase you at the same time that they're both being rebellious against these two dorks, especially. <laughs> there is no use for Duke Hudson in NXT. No, I'm he sorry. Sucks. He sucks. I like like we we've tried. Chase we've is tried. great as the yeah. un- as a disapproving no, father. He, he- sucks like he sucks as a character he doesn't do anything in the ring at all like oh. he's he 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 is a guy who's Fuck so is a harsh a term and i don't want to use that on a guy because you know we don't we don't you know it's not his fault no the character work sucks and but like any how many times have we watched a duke hudson match and all of the various iterations of him and we, name me one good one no you're you're correct he does have some charm as a chase U student but that's about it uh, but they but they no but they, he's not even as good as Bodie hayward no you're, you're correct on that he's, yeah, he, he's yeah, value, yeah he, he, there's no he, value over replacement no there's and, no value over replacement there i'm sorry and we've hit but, his and we've hit his joke so hard that he's now boring yeah he was one joke the joke wasn't that good 
He wasn't that good at it. I'm sorry. No, he stinks. Duke Hudson stinks. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, what, you want to end there? Yeah, that's okay, it. Well, there. That's it. No, you know, <laughs> as soon as, if you want to be successful in radio, you know what you need to be? A little bit angry. A little bit angry because little otherwise, little you know, as you get nicer, your your earning trajectory goes boo, down. Boo, boo. You won't you lose. Can, be nice. You can follow me on the increasingly frustrating X.com at Crap Game 13. You're telling me they haven't made a banger website out of that over the last year, Jeff. Oh, Chris, they've now decided that when you, when you like, uh, uh, quote tweet or whatever they're calling it now an article they will no longer print the headline in it it's just the photo with it and a link it's cool. terrible um i'm on blue sky but i don't post there it's jeff hawkins whatever the hell that thing is um you can follow me at, or you can follow uh, the show at shake the ropes all one word i also do a show on the fight game media network called the dynamite show about 20 minutes after we go live on youtube but for five bucks you can also get the audio the next day in your podcast droppers of all time it's usually myself and paul fontaine but this time it was myself and the wonderful kevin ely if you've never heard him from fight game media's the boom uh we we thoroughly deconstructed all the all the shenanigans on this on this Wednesday's dynamite and uh, yeah go over there patreon.com slash fight game media Chris has plugs he has trampus he has a mustache he has guitar lessons he has mustache lessons uh, yeah no I mean more and more you are hearing about tram fest uh, America's number everybody's one... talking about tram fest Chris uh, you can't you, I can't it's like I can't go anywhere <laughs> and, and not hear about it. Yeah, I turn Taylor left. Taylor Swift is I turn left. Tram Tram fest. Fest I turn, NFL I turn right. Tram fest. And like yes. he, the people are just they can't stop talking about it. It's in the hearts and minds of literally millions of Americans right now, and it will be. It, you know, it is. It is. It, it's Don't true. Oversell. It. No, I, I oversell. If anything, I'm underselling. We could be talking <laughs> upwards of billions around the world here, touched by Tramfest by the end of Tramfest. So there's only one way to do it. Uh, you got to get out to San Diego Peak Aero Tramway out here in Albuquerque, uh, and 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 or catch me on the Instagram. Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R underscore N-O-V is my name on there. I'll be posting about Tramfest so you can let it touch your heart and your mind uh, and maybe your wallet if you can want. Can you get the boys in merch to make one with, with one of the cars of the trams with a giant Novembrino mustache on it? Yeah. Tramfest. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, like the, the tram has a mustache on it, like the mustache and the goatee. Hell yeah. Let's go. Guitar uh, lessons, D O C T O R underscore O N O V. That's also true. And and then, you know, like let's like end on the Tram Fest song. Tram Fest, Tram Fest. Everybody's talking about <laughs> Tram Fest. Oh, it's Tram Fest, Tram Fest. Everybody's talking about it.